Hey YouTubers, it's Charlie. So hopefully you've all had a chance to see episode one of Korra book four, but this is going to be my review. And just because it's the first episode and there's a lot of stuff to get through, I made it a little bit longer and this is going to be a top 10. Heads up too, it looks like Amazon's going to be releasing episodes at midnight Pacific time. That's Thursday night or Friday morning, however you look at it. Nickelodeon posts them on their website a little before noon. So if you're willing to pay a couple dollars extra, you can watch the episode like eight, 12 hours before everyone else. And again, I know you guys will all be happy to know the weekly giveaway is back. All you have to do to enter is be a subscriber and leave a comment on this video. I'll announce the winner whenever I post my Q&A tomorrow, but careful for spoilers if you haven't seen the episode yet. Okay, here we go. Top 10 moments. Number 10, three years later. The high-speed rail system, Team Korra being pulled in all different directions, the new Earth Kingdom prints, and Ku Rira's mission to fix the mess in the Earth Kingdom. The world has changed a lot and the characters have changed a lot. Number nine, meet Wu, Prince of the Earth Kingdom. I couldn't find any information on who the voice actor was, but I'll try to find out by the time I post my Q&A video Saturday. Or if you do know, just write it in the comments. There's a whole lot to say about him, but he gives all kinds of exposition about what's been happening in the Earth Kingdom. Kuvira has been cleaning up the mess and he's been living in exile. We also find out how he's related to Hu Ting. They're like distant relatives, distant cousins. So he probably just came from one of the really wealthy families in Ba Sing Se. Based on the rest of the episode, it seems like he's going to be on one side of the conflict and Kuvira on the other, with the prize being the throne of the Earth Kingdom. The whole scene with the pies just let us know that Kuvira has pretty much won over the populace. Like, she's going to get the popular vote, but President Reiko from Republic City is backing Wu. So I'm wondering if the other nations of the world are going to back him too. It's probably just because he feels like Wu is much easier to deal with than a really powerful warlord. I don't think that President Reiko is going to be a villain or anything. I just think he's a politician through and through. If you remember that trailer scene with Zuko, his daughter, and President Reiko, it seems like the other nations are going to back Wu, and that's going to cause the greater conflict. That's going to be like the spark in the flame that's going to set Book 4 off. It'll be like the politicians of the world versus Ku Vira and her army of the people. Number 8, Team Korra Montage. So we start learning where everyone is and how they've changed. Three years does not sound like a lot, but everyone is a little bit more mature and they've gone from teenagers arguing about relationships to young adults arguing about politics. I also saw that a bunch of you were confused about some scenes in the trailers where it looked like Team Korra people were fighting each other. That's not the case and I'll totally explain it. You can see though how that might end up happening based on everyone getting pulled in different directions. Team Korra is not going to be broken apart for that long. Like they'll get back together eventually. Number seven, Kai and Opal to the rescue. So this was just like Mako's intro scene during book two all over again. He gets that really cool motorcycle chase intro when he does that big, you know, firebending takedown of those criminals, the triple threat triads, I think. Kai and Opal, exact same thing. I really am stoked about these new airbender costumes. They're gonna stand out really nicely against the metal bending army. But there are just so many awesome things to talk about, about you know, just where the air nation is right now in its state of development. They're basically like super cops now being dispatched all over the Earth Kingdom by Tenzin. And you can tell they're pros too, like they've been doing this for a long time. They're really good, even though they did lose those supplies. I think that was just to show that they were fighting a battle they couldn't win. Like it was supposed to feel like the mayor had no other choice but to sign Kuvira's deal. Number six, Tenzin's family all grown up. I love seeing Rohan with hair, like we haven't seen him in a long time. And then there's Milo, who looks like he's about the same age as Kai was during book three. Milo the boy becoming Milo the man was probably the best animation sequence in the episode, at least next to Kuvira's fight. We also get a really good look at Jinora with her hair again too. I know some people really didn't like her being bald. I didn't have too many issues with it, but she did look exactly like Aang. But I think that was the point. I think she was supposed to look like Aang, or she was supposed to remind us of Aang. Number five, Mako is getting sent to Ba Sing Se on permanent duty. Just one more nail in the coffin at Team Korra. This is going to put Mako and Bolin in direct opposition to each other, brother against brother. It's just like Opal's brother is on the opposite side from her. Like families are going to be in conflict this season. It's a lot like the United States Civil War, you know, politics, dividing families, dividing the country. Like I said earlier though, I don't think Team Korra is going to be at each other's throats for too long. I do think that they're going to have a happy ending, but things are going to get worse before they get better. Number four, meet Team Kuvira. Think about Team Kuvira as being an analog of Team Korra, or even Team Zaheer for that matter. But it's Bolin, Farik, Julie, and one of Opal's brothers, not Skrillex. I think his name is Pitar. 
The perspective shifts a couple times, but we're mostly seeing her inner circle from Bolin's perspective. I'm already starting to get a little bit nervous about what's going to happen to Team Korra though. The train itself looked amazing, like the high speed rail. I got the sense that visually the train was also supposed to represent the unstoppable nature of Kuvira this season. Like even rocks on the tracks weren't enough to stop her. She's just metal bending the shit out of everything in her path. Speaking of which, number 3, Kuvira versus the Bandits. Probably one of the coolest uses of metal bending that I've ever seen. It reminded me of book 1 when we saw Korra using more sophisticated bending techniques than we had seen in The Last Airbender, and like the metal bending police force going all Spider-Man with her cables. It just becomes pretty clear that Kuvira is doing everything she can to bring the Earth Kingdom to heal. Those bandits were so quick to accept her offer of joining the army. It sounds like just everyone in general in the Earth Kingdom wants some relief. Like they want some direction, someone to lead them, and they really don't care who helps them out. The result is, is that Kuvira is just constantly adding to her forces, whether it be the bandits or the states themselves and all the supplies. It wasn't really clear when she had that conversation with the mayor, but the contract said that they had to give her supplies and manpower. Like that's what she was taking from them. Number two, Kuvira's unification plan revealed. So she's making all the states swear allegiance in exchange for protection. It's technically not blackmail unless she sends bandits back to the city. And that doesn't seem like her flavor of evil. It feels like something Varric would have done. Like whenever he had people hijack Asami's shipments back in book two so she'd go bankrupt. Remember, he also framed Mako for that. Based on that Lego map that Kuvira was putting together, and yes, it did look like she was playing with Legos, she's almost done with her mission. Like she's almost completely unified the Earth Kingdom. The tease being that if she completes the job, she'll have all the combined resources of the Earth Kingdom at her disposal, including their manpower, most notably their manpower. So the potential is that she'll decide she's a better candidate to lead the Earth Kingdom than Wu is, and you get your conflict. Like she could raise up an army to fight off any invading force trying to install Wu on the throne, which in this case might end up being the Republic City forces, who just happen to be commanded by Zuko's grandson. We'll have to see how that plays out. They didn't come right out and say Kuvira's not going to give up control of the Earth Kingdom once she's done, but she's the villain, so it's going to happen pretty soon. And my number one moment, of course, Korra is an underground MMA bender. Kuvira's been getting sharper, literally, and Korra looks like she's barely treading water. Not good. I totally love the WTF reveal though of what she's been doing for the last six months. Just basically getting the crap beat out of her. In the trailer we saw a big spirit world montage. If anyone saw Superman 2, like the really old Superman movie with Christopher Reeve, he basically gave up his powers to become human but found out that the world still needed him to be Superman, so he literally had to hitchhike all the way back to the Fortress of Solitude to get his powers back. Just like we see Korra here marching through the snow back to the spirit portal. So yes, she's definitely going to get her mojo back at some point, but she's going to have to have a call to action. Something has to change to slap her in the face and wake her up, because right now it looks like she is completely lost. Let me know what your favorite moment was. There's a whole lot to pick from, and let me know what do you think is going to be the big call to action that's going to make Korra go back to the spirit portal. Overall, I gave the episode a solid A. I totally love the way they got through all that exposition and reintroduced us to the characters in the state of the world. It's like they're just setting up a giant pie show board, and now we get to watch the game unfold. In fact, if you actually rewatch the episode of Book 3 when Asami and Bolin play pie show, she has this really good speech about what it takes to win a game. I bet there's a really good lesson in there for what's going to happen in book 4. So here's a clarification from some of those scenes in the trailer that everyone was confused about, because we actually got most of it answered. So first off, here's Korra in her MMA outfit in the swamps, it looking like she's going to get her butt kicked, especially when she gets captured in liquid metal. Here we see Bolin jumping to escape from one of the giant mechs. You can kind of see it jump down, it's a little fuzzy. Maybe he turns against Kubira soon? Clearly someone else from the army is after him. This person on the train that Asami is fighting with the short hair, that's Opal's brother. I know everyone wondered if it was Bolin or Mako, thankfully it is not. This here though, with Korra is Mako at this White Lotus temple. No idea where it's located though. This top scene also kind of looks like it came after that big swamp fight scene just because she looks like she got the crap beat out of her. So yes, I mean, Team Avatar is going to be pushed apart by all these political forces, but they will come back together eventually. I'm hoping it's like maybe the third, fourth episode when we see that, but who knows. So really good news for any fans of the comic book. 
Brian Konietzko basically said that he's going to double down on the comic book after Korra Book 4 is out. Like, he's hoping to work more on the comic book. So, I know a lot of people were wondering what's going to happen with the comics. They will continue. If you're wondering where to buy them, you can just get them on Comixology online if your local comic book shop doesn't have them. I will be posting a Q&A for this tomorrow, so be sure to leave all your questions. There's a whole lot of stuff to talk about. Right now though, you can click here to get that video out of the annotation as soon as I post it. And you can click here for my top 10 Avatar villains. Thank you so much for watching, so let's all high five. Do not forget, Star Wars Rebels tonight. Be sure to watch it.